and turn it into a prototype. So we had, I think I still have it. And we're going to make our prototype of a website that looks like that. Notice the wireframe is pretty bare bones. Again, when you do your design, it is likely you will just have one wireframe for the entire site. You might possibly have two. But don't think you need a wireframe for each page. What this represents is that we have a header, nav, a content area, which is different for each page, and then finally a footer. So when we create our prototype, first thing we're doing is we're making a template. And a template consists of an HTML document along with a CSS file. We're going to do our best to make that HTML document complete, at least for the areas that all the pages have in common, which is a header, navigation, and footer. Because once we start cloning this to make the rest of our pages, we don't want to have to go back and make changes to three, four, five, six pages. It's, it's nice if we get it down when there's only one page, the, the initial template. The CSS we're less concerned about because we can <coughs> make the changes to all the pages by simply changing one of the pages. So let's download where we left off last time and finish it up. If my memory serves, we were most of the way through the first version of the prototype and just had a few more things that we needed to do. And here we are. In this unit, we are focusing on the CSS. So therefore, I'm not going crazy with the HTML. There's a lot of stuff that we could do. For example, there could be images here, the logo, and all that. But my focus is really going to be on the CSS, and specifically the CSS to develop a layout. So there's a few more finishing touches I want to put on this before we're through. Uh, the first of which is I want to make these links look a little bit better. And if you look, they kind of run together a little bit. And we can maybe do something to make them stand out a little bit more as links through our CSS styling. So that's what we're going to do. That's what our first job is going to do. All right, if you remember we talked about last time, and if we look at the HTML for this, The links are in a unordered list, which makes sense. That's really what links are, or an unordered list of links. That's really what a navigation is, rather. So 
that's a good structure for this. Uh, we're going to keep the HTML the same. Remember, our HTML should reflect what the content is. A navigation is a list of links, so that's what our navigation is. We, are, however, however, can make that look any way we want to. Now, normally, a list, an unordered list, is thought of as a bulleted list. But there's no reason why it has to have the bullets. There's no reason why it has to have it oriented vertically. And as you can see here, what we did is we got rid of the bullet points. And we made the list items be displayed horizontally. All right. Now, let's try to put a little bit of space between the links. Now, normally, we would say margin left five pixels. Remember, we have in all our boxes, and again, these things are little boxes for CSS. We have the width of the box. We have the width of the border. We have the path between the border and the text. And then we have the margin as the space between the boxes. So it would seem reasonable if I put a margin left on these that there would be space between them. Let's try that and see. Oh, there is some space. Good. So there's some space in between them. Now, let's go and let's play with this. And let's make our links look a little bit more like buttons. So I'm going to go and I'm going to say nav A. Again, I'm saying nav A instead of just A, because I don't want all my links on the entire page. I just want the links in, within that particular navigation section. So I'm going to give a border of one pixel solid black. I'm going to give a padding of five pixels. And I'm going to get rid of the underline. Because if we set off the links by putting a border around them, then maybe we don't need the underline to indicate to the user that this is a link. So I can say text decoration none. All right. All right, there we go. The only thing I don't like this is the families drop down to the other line. So I will fix that by maybe cutting the margin a little bit and cutting the padding a little bit. And there, they fit going across. All right. Now, if you remember, I can give the border some rounding by saying border radius, say three pixels. I'll make it very slightly rounded. Now, the
The one thing that you can also do with links is links have what are called pseudo classes. They're not really classes, but they allow you to code different CSS for different circumstances relating to the link. So for example, if I want a certain behavior when the user puts their mouse over the link, I can do this. Nav A colon hover. And what I can do is I can give sort of a mouse over effect, because hover means put the mouse over it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch the color and the background. I'm going to make the background blue and make the color white. So now when we put the mouse over this, we get that effect. Now, we do all these things not just because we think it looks cool or, or makes the page look nicer or whatever, but for effect. That helps indicate to the user that these are links. All right? So that is a visual cue to, to, to users that these things are links. So we can use a mouse over effect. Uh, we can put borders around them. Uh, anything that we want to. We can even maybe make these stand out a little bit by saying maybe I'll make the original have a background of light gray and a color of blue. And light gray would be six hex hexadecimal numbers that are close to each other. The digits, remember, being from 0 to F. So if I said C, 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 that should be a fairly light shade of gray. Pardon me? No, it's a lot of, remember, we're talking about light. So that's a lot of light. So a lot of light is going to make for a light thing. If there's only a little bit of light, then there's going to be dark. It's like, oh, because, zero, zero because zero, zero is black, yeah. It's like the difference between, uh, it's like the difference between mixing paint and mixing light, okay? If you mix paint, if you add more paint together, it's going to get, the shade's going to get darker. Whereas with light, if you add more light into it, it's going to get brighter. So it is a little confusing, but uh, again, there we go. All right, let's play with the background. Let's look for a nice background image. I'm going to find a background tile generator. where we get to go, and we can say, of course, this doesn't look like it's working. Oh, it is. It's just not a very involved pattern. So this is sort of giving it like a, a almost like a stone kind of pattern. I don't know what would be the best way to describe it. An old TV. An old TV. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but we can play with the color. So we can pick the, the color that we want. And we'll go, we'll continue the yellow theme. So we'll go with that. And there's filters that we can add here or take away. So 
we find one that we like. How intense the pattern is. Invert the pattern, and so on. Actually, I don't like this. <laughs> So we're going to skip it. But what we could do then is we could download the background image. And that background image did not save it yet. I think it broke. Oh, you know what? There's quotes in it. we get that background image. There we go. And we could put on our page. But I don't like that background image. Let's try this one. It's just a little better. We can pick the color we want, how bright it is, how saturated it is, how bright it is. Then we can pick patterns that we want. I'll go with that one. Effect intensity, a little more subtle. Effect size. All right. Then we can download it. And we download the image. So I can then bring that in. And I can put it in my CSS. Background tile. And we can view it. And something didn't work. <laughs> no. There we go. Yeah, doesn't look half bad. All right. I actually could have seen this said background or background image, just not background, background image. All right, the last thing I want to do is I want to deal with the fonts, okay? Because if we look at this, uh, the font is the default font of the browser. Because remember, with anything that deals with the appearance of a web page, there are the browser defaults, and there is what you put in your CSS that overrides those browser defaults. So the browser default font for everything is on typical Windows machine, it's Times New Roman, which is, how do I want to say it? It's a very, very straightforward, plain type. It doesn't really have sort of a feel to it. You know, it, it's just very very basic, very, uh, I'm trying to think of words to describe it without making it sound like I'm criticizing it, right? Because it's not like it's horrible, but it isn't particularly uh, uh, a 
evocative of any sort of feeling. But we can go and we can put in fonts. Now, the way fonts work is you have to remember that fonts might not be installed on every machine that you use. Okay? So, a very famous font is Helvetica. There's actually a documentary movie made out about Helvetica, the only font that has its own movie, to my knowledge. But Helvetica is not found on Windows machines. Helvetica is found on Macs. So if I say Helvetica, I'll be darn, it worked. On many machines, it would not work. And therefore, you would specify an alternative. And then finally, you put either serif or sans serif for the generic browsers, serif or sans serif font. Now, fonts are like colors in the sense that if you use a couple of them, they're good. They can, they can help make the site maybe more readable or whatever. But if you use too many, it gets to be overkill. Generally speaking, for smaller text and plain text, you want to use sans serif fonts, whereas for larger text, maybe serif fonts are better. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go in and Make the font a little bit smaller. All right, there we go. All right. So I'm going to get the effect of not having a font by changing the spelling of the font. So if it doesn't have Helvetica, it switches to Arial, which is pretty much identical, because Microsoft copied Arial with this. If it doesn't have that, it'll go to the default font, which is also Arial. All right. The bottom line is it goes through these fonts until it finds one that it has. And the browser will always have a generic sans serif font. Now I'm going to go and I'm going to pick, I'm going to Google, oh, before I do that, let me grab this URL because I probably should give them credit. Sometimes it will say on if, you, if you're required to give credit. If you can't find anything that says that, I would assume that you are required to give credit. Let's look for good font combinations. Helvetica and Garamond. Let's try that. So I'm going to make my H1s Garamond. And I'm going to leave the rest of the text as 
Helvetica, Ariel. So it's going to first look for the Garamond font. If it can't find that, it will use a generic serif font. So again, notice that we have the header in the serif font, which is typically a good use for a serif font. We have the remainder of the text in the sans serif font. Now, one thing that you can do to sort of get around the fact that people don't have certain fonts is actually download the font, all right? And there's a number of fonts available through Google that you can go and do. And let's look to see if we can find one. All right. Montserrat. Oh, here we go. I want to find a font that I can tell that I've changed the font. Poppins. All right, this tells you how to use it. All right, if you click on that. You have to put this at the beginning. For your HTML. And then in your style, I can say, let's make all paragraphs, or let's make everything inside a section have a font family. Of Poppins. I think I forgot to save stuff. There we go. So we have a mix of three fonts on here. We have the Helvetica Ariel for the links and for the footer. We have uh, the Garamond for the serif, and, uh, or the serif font for the header. And then we have the Poppins font that we downloaded for everything in the section. Again, it's a lot like colors, though. You don't want overkill. So two or three fonts is usually going to be sufficient. <coughs> uh, remember, all these things that you're doing, you're not just doing because you can or to make it look cool. You're doing it for meaning. You're doing it to set across stuff. In other words, this content up here is something different than this content here. So it ought to look different, right? Things that mean the same sort of thing should look the same. Things that mean something different should look different. All right? And you have a lot of things on your, uh, in your arsenal to make them look different. You can, you can use um, 
different fonts. You can use different colors, backgrounds, borders, font weight. That is, you can make it bold. Uh, you can use a, a, a italics. Um, all these things that you can use are, are in your toolboxes, not just fonts and colors. So use them judiciously. Use them with a purpose. Use them to set apart some kind of text. Like, for example, if, you know, we had a paragraph here that we really wanted to emphasize, we could actually put that paragraph in a class and emphasize it. Let's talk about classes, because I think I've talked about classes a little bit, but we could probably stand to talk about them more. And in order to talk about classes really well, I'm going to go and I'm going to create a couple extra paragraphs here. I'm just going to copy and paste. So here we have four paragraphs. Let's say this paragraph, there's something different about it. All right? Something different about it. Maybe it's important. Maybe it's a warning of some sorts. Maybe it's brand new information. Uh, for whatever reason, it's, it's important. It's different than the rest of the text. All right? We've already defined everything in the section looks a certain way with our CSS. How do we make just certain things look a little different? One of the ways we can do that is by putting a class on it. And I'm going to make my class equals important. All right. Now, a class. With a class, you could put several things in the same class. You know, if you think of a class of people or a class of automobile, not just one car in, in the class of convertible, all right, or sedan or whatever. There's a bunch of cars in those, all right? So a class re relates to grouping several things together, all right? So I can put more than one thing in a class if I want to. In this case, I'm not going to, but I could. And what we can do then is we can define a style rule for that class. And the way we do that, just like we do for an HTML tag, except we put a period in front of it. So if I say dot important, what I'm saying is everything that has the class important is going to look this way. And we can change it up many different ways. I could say, for example, font weight bold. Font color pound sign four, 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 four. For. So I've gone and I've made an indication that this is different than the rest of the text by making it look different. So now I'm going to go and look at this. That one paragraph is different. It's in bold and might not be obvious, but it's in a slightly different color. Let's go with the cliche and make the important things red. Oops. Color, not font color. What am I thinking? No wonder I couldn't tell the difference in the color. There we go. We can also define style rules based on an ID. For example, let 
maybe we want to make the credits a little smaller at the bottom of the page so it doesn't take up that much pay, uh, space. I could on this, pardon me? Yeah. EM means emphasis. Uh, EM means, it means like compared to normal size font. So if I say 2 EM, it would be twice as big. If I said 1 EM, it would just be normal size font. If I say 0.7 EM, it would be 70% the size of normal font. So I could put on this paragraph, ID equals credits. Have you noticed the credits on the bottom of the page are the fine print? Now, what's the difference between ID and class? A class can contain more than one thing, whereas an ID can only point to one thing. If you think about your ID, your ID number for school, all right? There's only one person that has your ID number. That's you. IDs wouldn't work if two people could have the same ID number, right? It'd be chaos, all right? But two people can be in the same class. Multiple people can be in the same class. If you think of class as a classroom of students or you think of class as a category of students like uh, CISS majors or whatever, all right? So that's an important distinction. Uh, an ID only relates to one thing. So I should only have one thing on the page that has an ID of credits, but I can have multiple things on the page that have a class of important, all right? So these are ways that we can refine our selector. Remember, a selector points to what gets this, this style rule. So, so far we've seen three or four, depending on how you count, selectors. We've seen simply an HTML tag, whereas everything with that HTML tag gets this rule. We've seen combinations of HTML tags, nav UL, any UL within the nav section. We've seen classes, which starts with a dot. And we've seen IDs, which start with a pound sign. Now we could, and again, you could kind of mix and match these ideas. I could say credits A. That would be A tag or any link inside something that has the ID of credits. So uh, I don't know, I'll make the, the color um, red just to stand out. So the idea is that, again, we started out with these selectors, like just being able to point to big sections of the page by using the HTML tag. Now we're seeing how we can refine those selectors to point to very, very specific things. A few observations. Uh, and some of this is directed to people that may have done web development before they came into this class. A lot of people that studied web development a few years back used div tags a lot. Div tags are still in the HTML language. However, it's better to use the HTML5 equivalents of the div tag. That is nav, header, section, footer. That makes your styling a little simpler. If you use div tags, you had to use IDs or classes or something like that along with the div tags. So this makes the CSS simpler because there's now a specific HTML tag for your nav section and for your header section and so on. Second thing, you're going to use classes probably more often than you're going to use IDs. All right? And the thought of it is, is that classes are just a little more flexible, right? Classes don't have the requirement that they have to be unique. So 
even though in this case there was only one thing on the page that I put a class of important on, that doesn't mean that on some other page there won't be a second or third thing that's important. If you use an ID, you've limited yourself to say, hey, there's only one thing that's going to be like this on this page. Whereas with class, you have more flexibility. So you're going to use IDs for styling, that is, a little less often than you're going to use classes. Now, there's other uses for IDs as well. When we get into JavaScript, we'll talk about those. But as far as styling goes, we're probably going to use classes more often than we're going to use IDs. All right. So now, what do we do? Let's assume we're happy with this. OK? And what we can do then is we can clone it. Now, ideally, I make sure that the sections that is the header, the footer, the navigation, are nailed down correctly. The appearance I don't care as much because that's in the CSS file. Once I do that, though, I can go and I can start cloning these things. Now, I'm not going to clone all of them, but essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to save all this stuff. And I'm going to clone the template. And name it the home page, index.html. Clone the template and make it the Iceland page. And I did something wrong. I think what I did is I renamed the template. So let's copy this. No, I did it right. Yeah, because there's a template, there's Iceland. Okay. I'm going to clone the template and make it the Hawaii page. Now, you can go in each one of these and make the changes specific for that page. Now, I'm not going to do everything, all right? But I am going to go in and I'm going to change titles and change headers. And if I was making a real prototype, I would go in and put the content for Iceland, for Hawaii, for the home page. So, home. And I then have a prototype. Again, I'm not like literally completing these pages, but you do enough just to show what the Iceland page is going to look like, what the Hawaii page is going to look like, what the home pages look like. And you have pages that you can move around to and navigate to. And it's OK that these pages don't work. I don't have those pages yet, because it's just a prototype. All right? So we've done our first prototype. What I'm going to do 
over the next few classes is do different versions of this. In other words, if I was doing this for an actual travel agency, I might come up with this layout as my first one. I might do other versions that have a different color scheme, a different layout, just so I could show them and we could talk about it. We could say what we like from one, what we like from the other. And we could go ahead and make our decision about what we want the final project to look like. Now, ideally, if I've done a good job with this and I've created the HTML in these comment sections creatively, this only should be changing the CSS file, right? I should be able to make, crank out as many prototypes as I want to simply by changing the CSS file. And that's great. That's why creating a website with 10 pages doesn't take 10 times as long as creating one page, right? You create the one page with the corresponding CSS, and then the next page you just change the section that's different from page to page. All right, any questions? All right, we'll see you up in lab. We'll do that. We haven't done that yet. That'll be in the next few classes. Is that difficult? Not really. Okay.